Early in the 20th century, the small seaside town of Marshfield, Massachusetts was a popular summer destination with its sandy beaches, quaint inns, and tiny cottages. After a swim at the beach, one could take a leisurely stroll through villages like Ocean Bluff, Fieldston, and Brant Rock. It was an idyllic place where everyone knew each other by name. Little did they know, a devastating event was about to ignite. The spring of 1941 was one of the driest seasons in the history of Massachusetts, with less than an inch of rain falling in March and early April. It had only been a few years since the Great New England Hurricane wreaked havoc on the Northeast, toppling over hundreds of thousands of trees. This created the perfect conditions for a major wildfire to occur, as a lingering wasteland of potential kindling lie dormant around the state. Fire departments throughout the Commonwealth were put on high alert, as wind gusts of over 40 miles per hour stoked a staggering 250 wildfires across the state. Officials temporarily closed state forests, and airplane pilots were advised to be vigilant and radio in any signs of smoke. Even a small fire in these conditions could quickly turn into a major inferno. But in Marshfield, just two days earlier, an advisory committee decided to revoke the annual $300 appropriation for the auxiliary firemen to burn the marsh grass as a fire prevention measure. This appropriation is unnecessary this year. This was a decision they would soon come to regret. So on April 21st, residents went about their daily routines. At Winship's, a popular department store, a sales clerk casually stocked shelves in preparation for the inevitable influx of tourists. At Bessie Wright's, a local general store and post office, Charles Starrett sorted through the mail, preparing for the day's deliveries. In Marshfield Fire Chief Silas Wright was having a cup of coffee when suddenly, at 1.40 p.m., he received the call he'd been fearing. A gas station owner reported a small grass fire, playing it off as if it were no big deal. But when Silas ran outside, he saw a towering plume of smoke rising from the northwest, with heavy winds fanning the blaze directly towards Brant Rock. This was no small brush fire, and he needed to act fast. He got on the phone with Police Chief William Pratt and urged him to warn as many residents as possible. Then, he called the surrounding fire departments for help and sounded the alarm. Upon hearing this, a banker stepped outside, saw the smoke, and said to a customer, it looks like it won't amount to much. At the Brant Rock Barber Shop, Charlie Najem was halfway through shaving the face of his buddy, Jimmy Plett, when they heard the fire whistle. At first, they ignored it, but when the pair stepped outside, they were stunned to see a raging fire rushing towards them. They quickly darted into the Ocean Bluff House, yelling, Fire! 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 Get out now! At Bessie Wright's, Eva Starrett quickly collected stamps, letters, and valuable town documents and stuffed them into a safe. But 15 minutes later, the landmark store was engulfed in flames. Mrs. Cheney, who had a summer cottage on Ocean Street, called the town hall. Operator, I own a house next to Bessie Wright's store. Well, you don't anymore. Windblown embers were now raining down upon rooftops. Within the first 30 minutes, 30 cottages had burned to the ground. 300 in the next hour. Beer bottles at the Ocean Bluff Casino exploded like hand grenades, spouting scalding liquid 30 feet into the air. In Holy City, the stained glass windows at St. Anne's Church shattered under the intense heat. Residents barely had time to gather their belongings as the fiery demons sought to destroy all of their worldly possessions. Street after street went up in flames as entire neighborhoods were swallowed and destroyed. Those who lost everything watched helplessly from a nearby field. A pair of newlyweds, just back from their honeymoon, saw their brand new home disappear right before their eyes. They needed to extinguish the fire before it could inflict any more damage. Teachers, store clerks, mailmen, anyone available grabbed hold of a hose and jumped into action. While fighting the blaze, Police Chief Pratt clutched his chest and suddenly collapsed from a heart attack. But he got right back up and continued to fight the fire. At Samoset Street, the Plymouth Fire Chief yelled to his men, we will hold our ground. This was it. The men readied themselves for the relentless flames heading straight towards them. But suddenly, the wind shifted, the fire slowed, and just four hours after it began, the Great Brent Rock Fire had devoured itself. That night, a blood red sky hovered over a blackened landscape. A Duxbury fire engine sat burnt out and abandoned. Telephone poles stood like charred toothpicks. 
and scattered chimneys marked where homes once were in this otherwise indistinguishable wasteland. That day, the official record of the Marshfield Hills Fire Station read, Brant Rock Fire, not a hell of a lot left. By that night, over 70 homeless families were given shelter. A resident said it went up just like that. Selectman Robert Bowles sat wearily with his head in his hands, his face covered in soot. We were licked in the holy city. Entire neighborhoods were wiped out, but incredibly, no lives had been lost. Over 600 buildings were destroyed, making it the most expensive fire in the history of the South Shore. Gradually, they'd rebuild, and the community made efforts to ensure that devastation like this would never happen again. Zoning laws were changed so houses could no longer be built so close to one another, and new building codes prohibited the use of beech wood. Winships and Bessie Wrights found new locations. Parishioners from St. Anne's temporarily attended mass in the famous Fieldston Ballroom. In the wake of this horrific fire, people wondered what had caused it. Some claimed it started at the corner of Ocean and Plymouth Streets after a couple of teenagers threw a lit cigarette out of their car. Others believed that it was kids playing with matches. One paper even reported that the horse grass ignited after sunlight was magnified through broken glass. But at the same time the fire was first called in, a spotter plane circling overhead snapped a photograph. Yes, there was a small fire near the gas station, but the image also revealed another plume of smoke drifting from the marsh grass. The same marsh grass, which had been deemed unnecessary to burn by the town committee earlier that spring. And to this day, people continue to dispute the origin of the Great Brant Rock Fire. You know, I have a personal connection to this story. My great-grandparents lost their home on that fateful day. And after I gave a talk in Marshfield about this event, a man came up to me and said that he was an auxiliary fireman during the Great Brant Rock Fire. He leaned over to me and said, you know, they should have given us the $300 to burn the horse grass. Crazy people, crazy people, crazy people like me go crazy over people like you.